Oh. Praise to Jesus, he can do what no one else can do. Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, as we conclude our study in the book of Mark this morning, I plan on next Sunday starting the book of Acts, Lord willing, the book of Acts, Mark chapter 16, and once you find your place, I invite you to stand as we honor God with the reading of his word. Mark chapter 16, we're going to begin in verse number 9. Mark 16, verse 9. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the re uh, res uh, residue Neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and unbraided them and, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them. That's important. That's an important phrase. And confirming the word with signs following. And all of them said, Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we are to the preaching and teaching part of the service, Father, once again, I ask that you would empty me of myself, Father, that you would cleanse me of my sin, and that you would fill me with thine Holy Spirit, that I may preach, thus saith the word of the Lord. Father, this morning, as we conclude this study of Mark, the gospel according to Mark, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, and what we have before us in this short set of scriptures. Father, I ask that you would help us to pay attention or that you would help us to stay focused on your word and the message of your word this morning. We would not allow Satan to buy for any time by any social media or email or even a phone call or that we would stay steadfast, Lord, this morning on the message. Father, I ask that you would meet with us this morning, that you would have your will and your way. Father, and I ask that you do all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. This, the subject this morning is the church's to-do list. The church's to-do list. We, what we come to in the book of Mark is the same thing we have in all the Gospels. is what we call the Great Commission, right? It's our mission statement as a church. Every single church that, uh, that Christ has established it has this same mission statement. The mission statement is to go and preach the gospel, right? Thank you, Brother Priest. Yes, we, it's the same mission statement. We, that is what we are supposed to do. And we have a to-do list. There's some things here that, we, that I want us to look at in these scriptures that... Uh, that I say our to-do list. 
Uh, because, listen, we are not here, we're not saved to just come on Sunday mornings and take up however, big, however many inches of chair that you're sitting in this morning. No, God, he didn't, God, Jesus didn't come to this earth to die on the cross to be buried and rise again on the third day just to save us to do nothing. Brother Scott Netterville, he has a message that he preaches that, that we're not to be do-nothing Christians. Right? Uh, Christian means little Christ, right? Like Christ. And so uh, we are to do as Jesus did, to go out and preach the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor, or a Sunday school teacher, uh, a trustee, a deacon, or whatever it is. Every single believer is to preach the gospel of Christ. Right? To your neighbor. You may not be behind a pulpit. You may not uh, be behind a, a lectern. But listen, you and I individually as believers and as church members are to go out and to preach the gospel. Uh, one of my friends, he says it this way. We're all to have gospel conversations. Uh, gospel conversations is what he says that uh, he likes to focus on. Uh, at the church that he pastors. And so uh, the first thing I want us to see this morning is the church is to hold on to God's word. One of our to-do lists is to hold on to God's word. And, and we look in verse number 9, and if we look through 9 through 14, that the, there's some disciples uh, that did not believe eyewitnesses' account that Jesus was alive. And if we, let's look at the first thing. In verse number 9 and 10, and we see Mary Magdalene. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, and by the way, that's why we meet on Sundays, right? That's because Jesus rose on the first day of the week. And on the, early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. Now, we know he, he, Mary and Martha went to the tomb uh, there and... They, they saw him and, and told him to go back and tell uh, the, the, the disciples and who? We discussed this last week. And Peter, right? Uh, that, he, that he has risen because, uh, remember, the, the disciples, uh, they didn't quite think that Jesus was who, uh, uh, the, the, quite the Messiah that they were expecting. They were expecting a king. They were expecting a political leader, right? That they were going to take, that, they, that their, the Messiah was going to come and get them out of bondage, so to speak, or out of uh, Roman rule, and they were going to be on the top of the pyramid, the political pyramid, and the, politi the uh, military pyramid, and they were going to be back on top, like when David was king and when Solomon was king, right? And so, uh, but Jesus did not, you know, he's going to come later and do that, but they didn't see that in the Old Testament, even though there was prophets that declared this, specifically Isaiah chapter 53, right? And so we, we, they missed that, and so uh, they kept missing the fact that even though he was going to die, they continued to miss that he said he would rise again. He said he would rise again, and now we see that Mary uh, Magdalene had come back uh, to tell the disciples that he they, that he's alive. Now, can you imagine that that uh, uh, the, the the disciples there, the eleven of them, are there weeping and crying uh, uh, because of what had happened to Jesus and been put on the cross? And then you have Mary Magdalene who come in and said, "Hey, hey, hey, hey! Listen, he's alive." I'm sure she was excited. I mean, Jesus radically changed her life. Having all them devils and being possessed and Jesus cast them out and she, her life was radically changed by Jesus. And then she goes and she sees him, tells her to go back and tell the eleven and Peter, or the eleven with Peter, and, and then they're like, that's not right. That didn't happen. I mean, I can, I, I'm just putting myself in, in, in their shoes, uh, so to speak. And we've all here, you know, uh, when somebody says something that we don't believe. Nah, that, that, that's not right, Mac. Mary, Mary, you must have saw something else. You didn't see Jesus. And 
And so uh, they didn't believe her. Then we have two disi other disciples that are on their way to Emmaus. Look at verse number 11, or verse 12. And after that, he appeared in another form unto, them, uh, unto two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it unto the, res, the, res, the residual, neither believed they. So, they. so we had two of them, two of the disciples, on their way to Emmaus. If you, you go into uh, Luke and look at what was going on there and uh, read that story of how that, that we're on their way and he, didn't, he, he, he caught up to them and he didn't reveal himself to them right away and, and they were mourning and, uh, of what had happened and Jesus asked them, well, what happened? And he, they told him, and, and then a, 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 as they were walking to Emmaus, it says that he preached the scriptures to them. It says he expounded the scriptures to those two disciples, and as they got to Emmaus, uh, he asked, they, they asked Jesus to stay and to eat with them because it was late. And as he, he, it says that Jesus blessed, the, blessed it, and he broke the bread. It says when he broke the bread, their eyes were open. So you had Mary Magdalene who came to the disciples, the eleven, and told them that he was alive. Now you have two of the dis other disciples that came and to tell the rest of them, hey, he is alive, but three witnesses, three different witnesses, you know, I think the, the God's law had got to have a certain amount of witnesses, right? Yeah. And so the, the rest of the disciples, the other nine said no. And I'm sure Thomas was the leading one saying, prove it. Prove it. We always say nowadays, proof's in the pudding, right? Well, the, disciples, the rest of the, of the nine said, no, no, he's not alive. You're just like Mary. You saw a ghost or you saw some spirit or what? No, you didn't see him. They didn't believe Mary. They didn't believe the, the other disciples who walked to Emmaus. So Jesus shows up. Verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. Now, let me help you out. I wouldn't have wanted to be in that room myself. I would not have wanted to be in that room when Jesus shows up. Because I'm sure that was not a pleasant conversation. Because remember, Jesus told them on their way to Jerusalem, we covered this, that he was going to die, but then on the third day he was going to rise again. So I, in my imagination, I know uh, Matthew goes into more detail of this, and, and that we know about Thomas sticking the finger and into his side and looked at the, uh, the, the nails on his hands. and we, 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 we understand that, but just that conversation of him saying, I told you that I was going to go before you to Galilee, when I, when I was, when I, that I would rise and I would go before you in Galilee. They have not yet be, really trusted Jesus' word. He said, I'm going to go before you to Galilee. You've had three different witnesses tell you that I was alive, and you didn't believe them. Just as those disciples were supposed to hold on to God's word, hold fast to Jesus' doctrine, we, our, one of our to-do list is to hold on to God's word. We know that his word is trustworthy. Probably the most watched message that we've had here at the Garth Road Baptist Church is the one that tell Jericho two weeks ago. Folks, we, uh, just as we discussed that just as Joshua found God to be trustworthy, 
we too can find that God is trustworthy. That what Jesus says he will do, he will do. So we are to hold on to God's word. This sure word that we have is trustworthy. Paul says this. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. We, Paul tells Timothy, hold on to the doctrine. Not only hold on to it, but continue in them. We as the church, we are to hold on to the doctrine of Christ. Hold on to the word of God and, and, and believe it, not doubt it. We're not to be as those disciples have in doubt after these eyewitnesses told him, told them, no. Hold on to God's word. We have a more sure word, don't we? Number two, the church on the to-do list is the church is to be dedicated to the gospel. Verses 15 through 18. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, world, preach the gospel. Right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the next, that's on our to-do list. We are to preach the gospel to every creature. We as the church are to make much of the gospel. We never outgrow the gospel, folks. We never grow beyond the gospel. Because without it, we wouldn't be saved. No, we grow deeper into the gospel. No, we, our lives, we are to make much of the gospel. Listen, I know... Football is on the horizon. All these preseason games are starting, and we're getting close to September, the postseason in October of baseball. We can make much about our lives, can't we? Different ha uh, hobbies that we have. I enjoy getting to watch the Rangers play. I haven't been able to watch the Rangers play as much as I have this year in time in, in years. I enjoy watching the Rangers just as Miss Charlene enjoys watching those other club, the second rate club in here in Houston, right? No. I'm just messing with Miss Miss Charlene. We, we can spend time talking about our hobbies, don't we, can't we? We can, listen, we can take up time with the hobbies. I, you ask my wife. I like to watch fishing videos. I like to fish. We can spend time on those hobbies that we like to do, but the thing is, is, they are not to take the place of what me as a believer, as a Christian, that the orders that Jesus gave to me. I'm not to make those hobbies or my job more than the gospel. Because this place is not my home. I'm just passing through. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through, right? You don't want me to. Do you want, do want me to sing it? <laughs> no. Yeah. But no. Oh, listen, listen. I'm to make much of where I'm going, and not only where I'm going, but why I'm going, how I how I'm getting there. I'm to make much of the gospel of Christ. That means we're all to preach it. 
we're all to teach it. I heard Brother Roy this morning in Sunday school. He, he, he made this statement that he didn't want people to know his kids to be his kids, or known for him, but known for Christ. Folks, that, that's your ma- as parents, that's your main goal. One, to get them saved. Two, teach them how to have that relationship with Christ. Be that example. Listen, this world, they're going to throw every wrench into every gear that they have in, of their faith. And they don't need to be coming home to a home of chaos and disaster and doubt. No, they need to be coming home to a home that is established, whose foundation is Christ, who is trusting solely in Jesus. Teaching the children the gospel, how to grow into the gospel. We're to preach it. We're all to preach it. We're all to teach it. And we are to support others that do the same over the world. Listen, you and I aren't in Cambodia. You and I are not in India. You and I are not in Pakistan or in Iraq or in Mexico or in Canada or in, the, 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 in Europe. We're, we're not there, but we can support those who are. They're preaching the gospel. That's part of the Great Commission. They're preaching the gospel. We're enabling them to preach the gospel by not only monetarily supporting them, but prayerfully supporting them. Praying for those as they are out there preaching the gospel. Because, listen, there's, kind of, there's those believers out there that they don't, get, they don't have the freedom of speech that, are, that we have here. Oh no, they, you know, they, they don't have the luxury of having a, a, a building out in the public like we do today in America. No, but they're out there, and they're preaching the gospel. They're out there leading folks to Christ. We're to support them with their endeavor. And then we have what people call the most confusing part of salvation that people like to add as evidences of salvation. Jesus here gives the disciples, when, we come to, when we're reading the Bible and we're studying the Bible, we always have to remember who the audience is, right? Who's Jesus talking to in these verses? 17, 18, and 19. The disciples. So we see Jesus here is going to give, he's going to lay out evidences of their salvation. Because this is who he's talking to. Evidences of those disciples who believe. He says, he that, in verse 60, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. He, uh, uh, listen, belief, faith in Christ, that, that's, what, that's how a person is saved, through their faith in Christ. That's what Jesus says, right? Those that believe are saved, but those that don't believe are damned, they're condemned. And there's evidences for these disciples of salvation. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Those disciples who believe the gospel, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection will show proof of their conversion. This is what we call the apostolic age. Jesus here says this is what they're going to be able to do. These are going to be evidences of their salvation. Just as 
these signs that Jesus lists here as evidences of their salvation, listen, there are evidences of you and my, uh, my salvation. Right? What are those evidences, preacher? Well, let's turn to Galatians real quick. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians in chapter 5, and we're going to see what the Apostle Paul tells us that is our evidences of our salvation. Galatians in chapter number 5. Look at verse number 16. This I say then, Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to, to the other, so that ye cannot do the, the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is evidence of those who are not saved, who do, have not believed the gospel, but those that have, look at verse 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such thing there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with them, or with the uh, uh, the, the affections of uh, and lust. So we see Paul gives us the evidences of our salvation post the apostolic period. You and I have evidences of our salvation. They're called the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, an apple tree produces apple. Why? Because it's an apple tree. Believers produce fruits of the Spirit. Why? Because they're believers. Those are the evidences of yours and my salvation if we are producing these fruits. So on our to-do list is not only to hold on to the Word of God, but we are to preach the gospel. Thirdly, on our to-do list is the church is to continue to trust Jesus. Look at verses 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them. Jesus is sat on the right hand of God. You know what he does while he's there? The Bible tells us what Jesus does. While he's sitting on the right hand of the Father, he intercedes for us, and he's an advocate for us. On Friday night, we were in our discipleship class, uh, as, we're as we went over of who Jesus is, what he did, and who he is, we talked about this very thing about Jesus uh, when, he right, when he left this earth and ascended up to heaven and sat on the right hand of God, what, what he does. In Hebrews 7, 25, the writer tells us, Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he uh, ever liveth, to make intercession for them. Listen, and while he's sitting on the right side of God, he's, listen, he's praying for you and I. He's interceding for you and I. Well, what is he interceding for you and I on? He's interceding that we are, that he is able to help us in the ministry. He's praying for you and I, making right decisions, and, and praying for you and I, and enabling us to do the ministry. You and I, we don't have the capability of doing the ministry ourselves. We don't have that power. 
You and I don't have the power to change someone's life. You and I don't have the power to save anyone. No, but while, he's, while Jesus is on the right side of God on the throne, he is interceding for us and, and enabling us and giving the, us, the, us power through him and, and, the, and, the, and the Holy Spirit to be able to witness, to be able to minister to others. He intercedes for us. Those situations you're having at home, Jesus is interceding on your behalf. Mom, dad, having trouble with children, those teenagers, he's interceding for you. Praise the Lord that Jesus is interceding. But he's also an advocate. He's an advocate for us. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 to, verses 1 to my, my little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Listen, listen Satan is accusing you and I. Listen, he, uh, Satan is trying to prosecute you and I. I mean, we, we know about Job, right? Didn't he go to? Didn't Satan go to uh, God and going to and uh, talking about to and fro, going upon the earth and accusing uh, Job before God? You know, if you do this, God, he will. Yeah, Satan is a. The great accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren, the Bible says. But I'm thankful. I have a lawyer that's never been beat, nor will ever be beat. He's better than Johnny Cochran. If any of y'all know who he is, I heard of him. Why? Can he never be, can he be beat? Because he personally paid for my freedom. I have an advocate that pleads on my behalf. I have someone to go to that will go to bat for me. He helps us, as he says in verse 20. And they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them. I'm thankful that the Lord helps me. Because I know myself. I know I'm not a great communicator. I know that I struggle from here to here. I know that my, my brain is like 10 steps ahead, and when I'm preaching that my mouth just can't catch up, and I stumble and I fumble through words sometimes. But I'm thankful that the Lord helps me. Not only does he help me, but he helps who? Who, who else does he help? Uh, uh, you, the church. So don't you, don't, you and I don't get the excuse, well, I just can't talk to people then you're denying what Jesus is doing for you. Then you're saying, Jesus can't help me. Then you know, what you're saying is, I can't trust you, Jesus. That's what you're saying. If you say, I can't witness to far, I can't witness to folks. Then you're denying that Jesus is trustworthy. Folks, will you and I have a to-do list as a church. We need to hold on to the doctrines. We need to we are to preach the gospel. And thirdly, we're to trust him. Until Jesus raptures us to heaven, we are to be busy about the master's business. 
We are. We have what we, what they, they say, those that were in the military, we have our marching orders. We have our orders. And he has given us everything that is necessary to do them. The question is this, one, do you know Jesus today? If, if you were to die today, because we're all going to die, right? If today happened to be that day and God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? Do you know 100% sure that if today was the day that you died, that heaven would be your home? What are you trusting in? There's a lot of folks underneath there, underneath the umbrella of Christianity, that say, not only do you have to trust Jesus, but you have to trust your works. You have to be baptized. You have to go and do this. You have to go and do that. You have to speak tongues. You have, you have to give everything that Jesus listed here. That was evidences of the disciples' salvation. Those are evidences that, listen, you have to do all those things. No, the thief on the cross didn't. He just had to believe. And he did. And because he did, on that cross, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Have you trusted Jesus today? Because he said, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. But there's this thing that's called sin that keeps us from salvation. Because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you trust Jesus, you put your faith and your trust in Jesus, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall, what? Call upon the name of the Lord shall be, what? Saved. You and I can't earn our way to heaven. There's nothing that you and I can do to get us there. All our righteousness are as filthy rags, right? Does the Bible tell us that? But if you receive Jesus, you put your faith and your trust in him, you have everlasting life. John 3, 16. That's the pulpit in which God the Father preaches his love to, to humanity. Secondly, my next question is for those of you who are saved. How are you on your to-do list? Are you holding fast to the word of God? Are you preaching and teaching the gospel? And are you trusting him day by day? How are you on that to-do list? Folks, this is not a list that you and I as men do with our wives as the honeydews. We just set them aside and do what we want to do. Uh, we, we don't get that. We don't get that. We, we can't just set them aside. Because one day, we will stand before our Savior and give an account for what we did with the life that he gave us. And the goal is to hear those wonderful words, well done, a good and faithful servant. How are we doing as church as on our to-do list? I would dare to say we all have room to grow on our to-do list in every area. Will you humble yourself this morning and acknowledge to God that there's areas in your life where you're neglecting Jesus' to-do list for the church? Will you come to the altar this morning and commit to the Lord that with his help you'll shore up those things that you've been neglecting?
us, and he has done everything that is necessary for salvation and for us to work on his to-do list. Will you submit to his lordship this morning? Father.